Please take your Bibles this evening and turn with me to John chapter 16. And I'll read verses 25 through 33 of John 16. These things I have spoken to you in figurative language, but the time is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figurative language, but I will tell you plainly about the Father. And that day you will ask in my name, and I do not say to you that I shall pray the Father for you, for the Father himself loves you, because you have loved me and have believed that I came forth from God. I came forth from the Father and have come into the world. Again, I leave the world and go to the Father. His disciples said to him, See, now you are speaking plainly and using no figure of speech. Now we are sure that you know all things and have no need that anyone should question you. By this we believe that you came forth from God. Jesus answered them, Do you now believe? Indeed, the hour is coming, yes, has now come, that you will be scattered, each to his own, and will leave me alone. And yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Amen. Now let's once again look to God and ask for his help as we come to the ministry of the word tonight. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this portion of your word, this farewell discourse of your son, the Lord Jesus. When we think about these chapters, we we are reminded of the hymn we just sang, What more can he say than to you he has said? Open our eyes that we might behold wondrous things out of your word this night. Send us your Holy Spirit and work in all of our hearts. For we ask these things in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Well, we are nearing the end of Jesus' farewell discourse that comes in John chapters 14 through 16. And the apostles make a statement here in verses 29 and 30 that make us ask, are they finally getting it? They have asked Jesus many questions He has said many things, as we've seen, that have just gone over their heads. He has had to correct their thinking at point after point after point. Perhaps things are starting to dawn on them, and their their eyes are starting to be opened. Is that the case? We shall see. Last week... We saw in verses 25 through 28, Jesus speaking of future openness and as opposed to the present hindrance. In verse 25, we read, These things I have spoken to you in figurative language, but the time is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figurative language, but I will tell you plainly about the Father. We saw last week that it means that now his speech was obscure, but as of Pentecost, it would no longer be obscure. He would, through the ministry of the Holy Spirit, tell them plainly about the Father in a way that he was not at this point. Tonight, we want to notice, first of all, the disciples assert their own progress in perception and assurance of faith And that's in verses 29 and 30. That's the first thing we'll look at 
the disciples assert their own progress in perception and their assurance of faith. Let's look again at verses 29 and 30. His disciples said to him, See, now you are speaking plainly and using no figure of speech. Now we are sure that you know all things and have no need that anyone should question you. By this we believe that you came forth from God. Now the way I asserted that heading there was on purpose. They assert that they are making this progress and that they have this assurance of faith in Jesus Christ. Let's notice they assert, first of all, their progress in perception. See, they say, now you are speaking plainly and using no figure of speech. Now we are sure that you know all things and have no need that anyone should question you. Now, they say, we are sure. Now we get it. For all of our slowness, now we finally do understand what you are saying, Jesus. Finally, we understand. Well, that's what they're, they're saying to Jesus. They are asserting their progress in perception. They know that they are, have been in the dark to some degree. They've been answering the questions. Jesus, excuse me, they've been asking the question. Jesus has been answering the questions, but they weren't understanding it even when he was answering their questions. He was saying things that they did not understand. Now they say, we get it, or at least we're starting to get it. They also assert their assurance of faith. Verse 30, the last part of the verse. By this we believe that you came forth from God. They're certain now about everything that Jesus has said, that it is true. We've asked, they're saying to Jesus, we've even challenged you as though maybe you don't even know what you're talking about at some points. Think of Peter's uh, remarks to Jesus on that night. Lord, you shall never wash my feet. As if he didn't know what he were doing. Thomas asking him questions. Philip asking him questions. Judas questioning him. Judas not Iscariot, we're told, in the upper room, this farewell discourse here. Each one of them asked Jesus these basic elementary questions, almost as if, Jesus, how can you be saying this? But now they're saying, now, Jesus, we see that you know exactly what you are talking about. In fact, you even tell us what we want to know without our asking. Back in verse 19, they were having their private discussion. What does he mean by this? And Jesus said, are you inquiring among yourselves? What do I mean by these things? So they're saying, now we get it. Now we're confident that you know all things. Well, what was the apostles' motive in telling Jesus this? Of course, the one possibility is that they really were getting it that they really did now understand. Well, it's possible that they sensed that Jesus was somewhat frustrated in his dealings with them, just as we see throughout the course of his earthly ministry when they said foolish things, they asked foolish questions, they didn't understand his statements that seemed to us uh, very, very clear and obvious. We have a different perspective than they did. But perhaps they sensed that Jesus was frustrated. Perhaps uh, they sensed that maybe he was about to give up on them, as if there were no hope for them, that they would never understand the things that he was saying. So that he was kind of like a teacher in a classroom who's trying to get this point across or this lesson across to her students. The students sense that she's struggling. She senses they're not understanding what she says. So she says, do you understand what I'm saying, class? And, and they don't. But they sense that the teacher is frustrated and they really want to go on to the next thing. So they say, oh yeah, we get it. In a sense, they feel her pain in her trying to get these things across. I don't know that that's what was going on in their minds, but perhaps that's what it was. 
So the, the disciples assert their own progress in perception. We're starting to understand and their assurance of faith. We really know that you know all things. In the second place, Jesus responds. That's verses 31 and 32. Let's read them again. Jesus answered them, Do you now believe? Indeed, the hour is coming, yes, has now come, that you will be scattered, each to his own, and will leave me alone. And yet, I am not alone, because the Father is with me. Jesus responds. And in his response, we want to notice a couple of things. First of all, we want to notice that he challenges their assertion. He challenges their assertion. He challenges, first of all, that they really have attained to this new level of understanding. And that's in verse 31. Do you now believe? Because it could be read this way. Do you now believe? As if he's very excited and thankful that finally he's gotten his point across to them. But I don't think it's to be read that way. I think it's to be read, do you now believe? Do you really believe? Do you really understand? Do you now believe? He challenges their assertion, first of all, that they really have attained this new level of understanding. Secondly, he challenges their assertion that their faith is so strong. Verse 32, the first part of the verse, he says, Indeed, the hour is coming, yes, has now come, that you, you men, who really, really believe, who really are strong in the faith, the hour is coming, yes, has now come, the hour of his death. Remember, he says, my hour has come, back in chapter 12. The hour has now come that you will be scattered, each to his own, and will leave me alone. That's why I say Jesus challenges their assertion here. He challenges that they really do understand. He challenges them, their, their assertion that their faith is so strong. The point he's making in a sense when he says, well, you say you have strong faith, but here is what's going to happen shortly. He's making the point of Proverbs chapter 24 and verse 10. I'll just read it to you. If you faint in the day of adversity... Your strength is small. Here was the day of adversity. They were saying in verse 30, Our faith is great. Now we know. Now we have no doubt. Our faith is strong. Jesus is saying in offense, That's what you say. That's what you think. But if you faint in the day of adversity, Your faith is in fact small. He says, the hour is coming that you will be scattered, each to his own, and will leave me alone. One writer that I read, he's a good writer, a preacher from the 19th century. He wrote this about Jesus' words here. He says, these words are not to be taken as implying any doubt as to the reality of their faith. In other words, he's taking a different interpretation from what, I'm, from what I'm giving you. He says, but rather, they're to be taken as expressing a joyful affirmation, like I said earlier, that Jesus was saying, do you now believe? Great. He goes on to say, it is just as if he had said, now you have reached the point to which I've been laboring so long to conduct you. Now, at length, ye do believe. Well, why do I take a different view of this? Well, here are my reasons. First of all, regarding their perception, regarding their understanding, if their statement in verses 29 and 30, if that statement were true, their statements, that now we see clearly, you're using no figure of speech, now we're sure that you know all things, now we really, really believe. If that statement is true, then one of two things must have occurred 
between Jesus' words in verse 25 and the disciples' words in verse 29. And those are these things. One, that Jesus must have changed the way he was speaking in so short a time, because he says in verse 25, These things I have spoken to you in figurative language. So either he changed the way he was speaking, or, or, and he said he would not change that until what? Till Pentecost. Or, Pentecost has come. Because Jesus said back there in verse 25, These things I have spoken to you in figurative language, but the time is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figurative language, but I will tell you plainly about the Father. And we've seen that he was referring to Pentecost and the coming of the Holy Spirit. That has not happened. So the, the apostles were making an overstatement about their understanding and about their faith. Secondly, regarding their faith and it being so strong, Jesus, when he says, do you now believe? And then he tells them what's going to happen. And in a sense says, your faith is small because you're going to all run away. You're going to tuck your tails and run at the crucial hour of testing. He is not saying that they have no faith. He's not questioning the existence of faith in their hearts. That's not what he's doing. He has affirmed that they believe in John chapter 13 and verse 10. And in John chapter 15 verse 3, he said to them, You men are clean. That is, you've had the washing of regeneration. You have been born again. You are Christians. He said, you are clean. In chapter 14, in verse 1, he said, you believe in God. In verse 27 of chapter 16, just a couple of verses before this, Jesus says, the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came forth from God. He's not questioning the existence of their faith. All he's doing is exposing the weakness of their faith. That's what he's doing. He's saying, yes, you may have faith, but your faith is very weak. You're saying our faith is strong. It's similar to what went on with Peter. Peter would follow him to the death. He would never deny him. He, he did deny him. He wouldn't follow him to the death. Does that mean Peter didn't really love him at all? No. He was weak. He sinned, and his faith and his love were not what he thought they were. Jesus is exposing the weakness of their faith. Here's what you think it is, but here is where it really is. You are all going to leave me and flee. Let's turn back briefly to Mark chapter 14 and verse 43. And read through verse 50 of Mark chapter 14. In John chapter 16, Jesus simply says, You will be scattered and you will leave me alone. In Mark, we have Mark's description of that event. And immediately, while he was still speaking... Judas, one of the twelve, with a great multitude with swords and clubs, came from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. Now his betrayer had given them a signal saying, Whomever I kiss, he is the one. Take him and lead him away safely. And as soon as he had come, immediately he went up to him and said to him, Rabbi, Rabbi, and kissed him. Then they laid their hands on him and took him. And one of those who stood by drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. Then Jesus answered and said to them, Have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to take me? I was daily with you in the temple teaching, and you did not take me. But the scriptures must be fulfilled. Then they all forsook him. And fled. He was talking about this departure of all of them from him at the time 
when he was arrested. He challenges their assertion. He's saying, you don't understand all that you think you understand. Your faith is not as strong as you think and as you are boasting that it is. So there is uh, the disciples asserting their progress and Jesus' response. First of all, he challenges their assertion. Two lessons from this challenge of the Lord Jesus before we go on. First of all, we learn something from the disciples here. We learn something from the disciples boasting about how much they understand, boasting about how much they believe in Jesus. Those are good things. It's good to understand the truth. It's good to believe in Jesus. But they were boasting about it. And we should learn from the disciples, let us beware of thinking too highly of ourselves. A simple lesson, but a very important lesson for God's people. Listen to J.C. Ryle's comments on these words. He says, let us mark these things and learn wisdom. The true secret of spiritual strength is self-distrust and deep humility. When I am weak, said a great Christian, then I am strong. None of us, perhaps, have the least idea how much we might fall if placed under the influence of strong temptation. Happy is he who never forgets the words, let him that thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. And remembering our Lord's disciples, praise daily, hold thou me up, and then I shall be safe. Let us beware of thinking too highly of ourselves. Perhaps there are few parts of the Bible that I have thought of more frequently and mentioned more frequently in my sermons and in my conversations with people in my 30 plus years as a Christian and my 20 years as a pastor as the instance of Peter asserting, I will never deny you, Lord, even if everybody else does. I would never, ever do it. I have frequently said, especially to relatively young professing Christians, and may I add, relatively young and careless professing Christians, I am 50 years old, or something like that. I've only been 50 for a little while. I'm 50 years old. I have been a Christian for over 30 years. I have a track record as a faithful Christian. I don't say that to boast. I have a track record as a faithful Christian to the point that I have been made a pastor in a Christian church. And now I can say two Christian churches. Churches in which the people of God care about who it is that is their pastor and use a biblical standard to judge who should be in the Christian ministry. And then I say, and I would not allow myself the kind of liberty that you are willing to take for yourself in this area or that area of the Christian life. Why, if you are willing, why are you so willing to take such liberties? And why are you so angered by people who tell you you ought to be careful? Why? Why? Maybe like the apostles. You just don't get it. Young, professing Christians 
who have either said or thought such things. We're better than that. Why don't you trust me? Why do you keep thinking I'm going to do this or that bad thing? Listen to me. Let us beware of thinking too highly of ourselves. Amen. Let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. God help us. May God help us. That's the lesson we learned from the disciples. Then we learn a lesson from Jesus. And the lesson we learn here from Jesus is this. To show people their sorry yet real selves is not unkind. We're great, Jesus. We understand. We believe. Oh, yeah? Let me tell you the truth about yourselves. To show people their sorry yet real selves is not unkind. Jesus presents them with the grim reality about themselves. And this is not contrary to the fact that he is encouraging them and comforting them here in this portion of the Word of God. It's not inconsistent with that fact at all. Certainly Jesus is not following the advice that we should not offend people. He's not following the advice that we should never speak negatively to them or about them. That's not, that's not what he does, is it? That's the common thinking nowadays. You don't offend people. You build them up. You encourage them. I even read early on in my Christian ministry something uh, to this effect that, well, you don't ever give someone a rebuke unless you sandwich it with encouragement. There's got to be encouragement on this side and encouragement on that side. Then and only then can you slip a reproof in the middle. Or else some other preacher gave a ratio. There would be, should be so much encouragement to so much reproof. Here Jesus is challenging them, telling them what they're really like. And notice, this is not his first challenge to them. This way of dealing with his disciples is really quite characteristic of Jesus, isn't it? As you go throughout his recorded ministry. Notice also that this showing them who and what they really are comes at their high point of the night, doesn't it? Oh, they're so, they're so encouraged. They're, they're so uplifted. Now we get it, Jesus. Now we understand. And he just drenches them with a bucket of cold water. He said, no, you don't really get it. No, your faith is not as great as you think. Here's what's going to happen very shortly. He's honest with them. Notice also that these words of Jesus, verse 32, come at the very conclusion of the farewell discourse. In this part of the Word of God that perhaps we could argue is the most comforting portion of the Word of God in the whole Bible. Three solid chapters of comfort and encouragement from Jesus' lips. And here is his ending note. Nah, you don't really believe in me that much. You're going to run away and leave me by myself. Because verse 33 is just kind of a wrapping up of the whole farewell discourse. He looks back over the whole thing, verse 30 and 3, and says, These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. Here's his final words. He had encouraged them back in verse 27. The Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came forth from God. You think that's the thing that will stick in their minds now? We thought we had attained. And he tells us, no, no. You're the guys, the same 11 guys, weak in faith, who started out the night, in a sense. 
So Jesus shows us that to show people their sorry yet real selves is not unkind. His ministry, in other words, is the kind of ministry that brings some people to say, you convict us, but you don't encourage us. That leads some people to say, we need to be uplifted and not deflated. To say, when our sins and our weaknesses are constantly exposed, it's oppressive. And it makes us discouraged. You ever heard that kind of thing? I've heard it coming up from my own heart sometimes. If that is your reaction to a ministry that exposes your ugliness to you, let me just say a couple of things. And I'm not saying there is no such thing as a ministry that would be harsh and oppressive, that doesn't preach the whole counsel of God, that doesn't preach Christ, that doesn't preach these encouraging statements of Christ. But people are not asking necessarily for a full-orbed biblical ministry when they say those kinds of things. They're saying, don't make me feel bad. So here are the two things I say. First, face the fact that if that's the way you think, whenever a preacher says something that brings you under conviction, or that reproves you, or that crosses you, or makes you feel bad about yourself in any way, face the fact that you are a part of this whining generation in which we live. I'm part of it. I confess. I am. That's the sad thing. Not that someone would want to say something that might offend me. And the second thing is this. If that's the way you think, when you hear things that reprove you, that make your conscience smart, but it comes from the Word of God, then confess that. Confess that as sin. Repent of it. Repudiate it. Turn away from it. And embrace Jesus Christ. Even when He hurts you. Because one thing I always end up saying to myself when I read Jesus doing these kinds of things, I think He was so good at exposing sin calling it what it was, reproving it, and bringing people under conviction for it. How can I even dare to go into a pulpit? Because I can't do that the way he could. He was very good at it and very faithful at it. And he often hurts us because we need to be hurt. We need to be hurt by the Word of God. We need to be humbled. We need to be broken. We need to realize our weakness and our sinfulness. Let me ask this question of unbelievers here tonight. How many of you, unbelievers, how many of you here tonight think that maybe the main reason you keep yourself at arm's length from Jesus Christ and from his church is this. You don't like it when your sins are pointed out. Or maybe I should say it this way. You hate it when your sins are pointed out. And when you're told you really need to deal with them. Might that be the case with some unbelievers here tonight? If that's the case, then it's that that's the sad thing. Not that a preacher would want to stand up here and talk about it. But if that is the case, let me urge you to do what I said just a moment ago. Confess that as sin. Turn from it and lay hold of Jesus Christ. Because the Bible says that even with sinners such as you, Jesus Christ will receive you. And even with sinners who are impatient 
with their sins being addressed, He is very patient with them. And He will be patient with you and He will continue to bear with you and to work with you and to be merciful even with you. But you must turn from your sins and trust in Him. And I urge you to do that this very night. So as we consider here Jesus' response to the disciples' assertion of their progress and their faith, first He challenges their assertion, then secondly and finally, He affirms that the Father is with Him. That's in the last part of verse 32. We read there that He tells them, you're going to leave Me all alone. You're going to be scattered, each to his own. And then he says, and yet, I am not alone because the Father is with me. He affirms that the Father is with him. This reminds me of a statement of the Apostle Paul. If you'd just turn there briefly, 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. Verses 16 and 17. Paul had an experience somewhat like Jesus. We can't put it on a par with what Jesus went through on that night when he was deserted and fled in terms of all that that was a part of. But listen to Paul's words here. 2 Timothy 4, 16 and 17. He says, At my first defense, and this is when he was a prisoner in Rome, No one stood with me, but all forsook me. May it not be charged against them. But the Lord stood with me and strengthened me, so that the message might be preached fully through me, and that all the Gentiles might hear. And I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. No one stood with me, none of his friends, none of his Christian brethren from various parts of Europe and Asia, wherever they were coming from, none of them stood with him, but the Lord stood with me and strengthened me. And likewise, Jesus says, you all will leave me alone, and yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. This thought, this reality, that even after the apostles all left him, that God the Father would be with him, this thought strengthened Jesus. Even though he knew he was going to face being forsaken, not just by his friends, but even by his Father in heaven. That's what he was going to face that night. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The thought, however, that God was in reality with him strengthened him even as he went into that dark hour. He knew, I will have no friends with me. He knew, even my heavenly Father Himself will forsake me. That is, He will withdraw all sense of His presence, of His help, and of His comfort. It won't be there. But I know, He could say, I know He is with me. Remember, Christian, that God is with you. He is with you at all times. Just as He was with Jesus on that night, He is with you at all times. Remember how Jesus said in this farewell discourse that there are ways in which the Father deals with you in a way similar to the way He dealt with Him. Just look back at chapter 15, verses 9 and 10. He says, as the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. I kept His commandments. I abide in His love. You keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. You will abide in the Father's love. God deals with us in a way similar to the way he dealt with Jesus. And so if he was with Jesus, we know he will be with us. We know he will be with us even when we go through very difficult trials. Imagine that you're in a situation 
let's say you have been sinned against by your spouse in a serious way. Your spouse ends up divorcing you unjustly. Your family sides not with you, but against you. They see it his way or they see it her way, not your way. When it's, they don't see it the true way, they side against you. The brethren in the church don't fully understand the situation. They misjudge the situation and they end up holding you to be in sin in the matter. Now, in a sense, the whole world is against you. Your friends are against you. Your family are against you. Your brethren are against you. You are left all alone, as Jesus was. And yet, if you're a Christian, if you're God's child, what Jesus says about himself, you can say about yourself. Yet I am not alone. Because the Father is always with me. Those words will always be true about you, Christian. They will always be true. Always. We sang in one of the hymns earlier, Every human tie may perish. Friend to friend unfaithful prove. Mothers cease their own to cherish. Heaven and earth at last removed. Those things could happen. It would seem like the heavens and the earth are being removed. One day they will be. But, the hymn concludes, but no changes can attend Jehovah's love. It will always be the same. He will always love you. He will always be with you. We sing in another hymn, in our hymnal, Though friends should all fail us, and foes all unite. Even if all your friends failed you, even if all your foes suddenly got angry and came against you as one man, God is still with you. He's still with you. That's exactly what happened to Jesus, wasn't it? His friends all failed him. His foes all united. The Gentiles, the Jews, the powers of darkness, they all united against him on that night. And yet he could say, I am not alone because the Father is with me. He knew that God was still with him. What I described a few minutes ago, in that case with the family siding against you and the church even not seeing it right, siding against you, that would be a pretty severe trial, wouldn't it? Most of us have never gone through such a thing and we never will go through such a thing. None of us will ever even approach enduring all that Jesus Christ endured for us to deliver us from our sins. Yet the Father sustained him, did he not? The Father sustained him. And if you endured even the kind of trial that I described, God would sustain you. If God's presence can, assist, can sustain us even then in such a trial as that, can it sustain us in every other trial? Every lesser trial? Can't it? I ask you, is God, Christian, man, woman, young person, is God, who has been with you throughout all the days of your Christian life, is God going to desert you now? Is he going to desert you in the most difficult thing you ever face? Is he ever, ever, ever going to desert you? He is not. He is not. 
Let me read again from one of the hymns we sang. Even down to old age, all my people shall prove my sovereign, eternal, unchangeable love. And when hoary hairs shall their temples adorn, like lambs they shall still in my bosom be born. The soul that on Jesus hath leaned for repose, I will not, I will not desert to his foes. That soul, though all hell should endeavor to shake, I'll never, no, never, no, never forsake. And I just want to close tonight by reading from the end of Romans chapter 8. Romans 8, verses 31 through 39. And may God write these words on our hearts, brethren. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Brethren, nothing can separate us from God's love. Nothing can separate us from His presence. Though everyone forsake us and flee, yet the Father is with us. Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your words. We thank you that when we go through deep waters and when we go through fiery trials, you are there with us. You are holding our hand. You are carrying us in your bosom like lambs. We bless you that you who were with the Lord Jesus in his dark night are with us throughout every day of our lives. Write this truth upon our hearts. Help us to remember that you are with us and that you will never leave us nor forsake us. And we ask it in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.